favorites. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, if you will please join with me in standing in honor of the reading of the Word of God. For any visitors that we have, I'd like to go ahead and acknowledge that at the end we will say, or I'll say, this is the Word of God for the people of God. The response is, thanks be to God. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground of the uh, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his, uh, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into the woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you will, please join with me in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come today, to be able to worship you and rejoice in your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one that has made all things. We thank you that you are sovereign. May we, Lord, likewise follow suit in not only understanding that you are sovereign, but yield our lives to you. God, we understand by faith that you framed the worlds by your very words. God, help us to listen, to seek you out through the reading of your word, to pursue you with all that we are. Lord, I ask that you would speak through me this morning, that if I fail to yield to your spirit, please speak to the hearts of your people here, that they might know truth from error, and likewise, Lord, give them wisdom and boldness to bring before me my error. For I want to be right with you, and I want to lead your people in faithfulness and in truth. Thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Full disclosure, how many of you read Genesis 2, getting ready for today? All right, like four. Good job. How about this? How many of you have ever read Genesis 1 or 2? 1 and 2. How about that one? All right, good. Now, here's the fun question. How many of you read both of those and said, sounds like two completely different stories of creation. Anybody? Yeah. All right. Now, I'll be honest. The way that they read, it almost does come across that way, right? Because in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth and formed life and formed uh, the uh, separation between the, the uh, waters above and the waters below, form the earth, the trees. There is a linear chronological way in which it is all done. Genesis 2, it's almost like, boom, he puts everything there, and then, boom, out of the uh, ground, he makes man, then he makes the, all the animals, and there's this seeming progression, and it's like, hey, th this doesn't match. They don't tell the same story. Now, I have to ask this question. This one seems a little bit off. And I've only got like four minutes to get through my entire sermon, so uh, I've got a lot to cover. So, here is my, my question for you. How many people are of the engineering or legal mindset where everything needs to be in this very linear chronological order? Anybody like that? I certainly am. All right, hands down. How many people have a brain where it, you can be an artist like Picasso kind of thing? Anybody? Come on. One right here that won't raise your hand. Uh, so, <laughs> nonetheless, she's not the only one because I had them in first service and I guarantee there are others in here like, uh-uh, I ain't raising my head in out at all. You can like pull my hand up, Jeff, and I still won't get it up. The, the point is, these are two different accounts written for those right and left brain kind of people. That's the way that I would understand it. <coughs> Anybody ever told a story, not like a lie, but literally a story to somebody else, like recounting something? I bet we all have done that. And so the point is, if you recount a story, you might tell it in one way that seems the most logical for you to get it across. But most likely you're going to have one of those other people 
like me besides you that says it has to be in the exact, the exact order of what took place. And if it doesn't match up, then I've got to correct you. Right? So God speaks to the right and left brain people in the first and second chapters of Genesis. Now the third chapter, it continues on from the second chapter because it's this beginning of the story of God's creation, uh, and that God's, not creation, but interaction with humanity. Okay? First one is all about the creation as a whole. The rest of it goes through God's interaction with humanity and how God makes us and then we break his command and then he works on redeeming us for the rest of the Bible. It's a really amazing journey throughout Scripture. So, let me get into this one this morning. Some of you parents are like, where is he going to go with this? <laughs> Don't worry, it's not going to be too much. But I, I do want you to understand, it does say that God created man first, right? Now, uh, let me go ahead and ask this one too. How many of you like to play with Play-Doh or clay or anything like that? Yeah, all right. So that's almost like what God has done here. We just follow in God's footsteps when we're playing with clay or clay and forming something. He created clay, if you will. Out of the dust of the earth, he made man. He made the beasts. And he did all of this. Now, that's not to negate what I said last week about God's sovereignty of speaking everything into existence. Because he did. He spoke and the worlds jumped into existence. He spoke and the light came to be. He spoke and all of a sudden there was grass and trees. He spoke and there was the sun, moon, and stars. <coughs> but whenever it gets down into like days five and six, he begins working with his hands and full reforming things together. That's almost what you see in, uh, in Genesis 2. I, get, I talk about the speaking. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. That's where you're going to get into that. So God makes man, and he says, it's not good that man should be alone. And he brings all of the animals before him. Now, I'm going to infer something here, because you only get the story of humanity. So my thought is that God had already created male and female of all of the animals, but he had not created woman just yet. And so I think that what happened was God brings before Adam all of these, these animals and says, I want you to name them, but I want you to see that there's something different about the animals than there is about you, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something different that's similar to you. It's going to make things <coughs> complete, if you will. Now that's not to say that man and woman complete one another. You are a full person right now. You're not a part of a person without having a spouse. Let me be very clear about that. But, he says it's not good that man should be alone. For why? Well, if you look at the latter part of Genesis 1, God gives a, a command. Be fruitful and multiply, right? People are not like earthworms. You don't break them in half and they form another, another one out of it, right? It would be really weird. There has to be a male and a female of whatever we're talking about as far as beasts of the earth, fish of the sea, birds of the air, and people. So the amazing thing is if you look at, at Genesis 1, it tells us something that we can graft into or infer into Genesis 2. You see it talks about the, the trees having the seed in them to continue on their species. Humanity has the seed within it to continue on that species as well. So God made us male and female for the propagation of the species. But it also, and God also made us male and female for a very specific purpose. You see, we have roles. Now, because of my limited time, I'm going to have to abbreviate a lot. But let me ask this question before. How many of you, especially ladies, have ever read, I will make a helper or a help me or help me? Uh, for him and read that and gone, that seems like we're a little bit lesser than man. Anybody ever read that? Jump that way? All right. I'm glad that you, you were honest about that. Now let me explain it a little bit getting into Hebrew. That the word is, uh, the words are azer, knig, 
uh, connect go or something like that. I, I, I would have to look at it to be able to read it. But the, the point is, azer is the word for helper. But did you know it uses helper more about God than it does about ladies? So you need to understand that, that God calls himself a helper. Okay? Now, the, the problem is a lot of times the way that we read this first one, it's almost like you're, you're looking at man being in a garage or something, being like, hey, woman, give me a 916 trench. <laughs> you know? Unfortunately, that's the way people read it. But that's not the way that it is. So I was thinking about this as I was going through and said, so what kind of object lesson can I give you? And as, as soon as I thought about this, I thought, it's like a, a doorknob and a key, right? Because a key can open up a doorknob, but they're not anything alike, right? Keys don't look like doorknobs and doorknobs don't look like keys. But if you look at the person next to you, generally speaking, we look alike, but we look different. And boy, that's a good thing. Because you don't want to look like this. Okay? <laughs> But we have similar structure. So let me give you a new example. This is a sound cord. It can be used for actually for lighting capabilities as well. But it's, this one's called an XLR. It's based upon the ends right here. Those ends, if you're looking at it from right where you are, they look pretty similar, right? Now, oddly enough, there's a male and a female part to them. Now, the point is they look similar, and if if they are not, if you don't have both sides of these, it doesn't work right. It's not going to work properly. So the point is, God made male and female for us to be able to work properly. The other part to this is that I want to continue uh, to, to explain what that azer, and I'm not even going to try the other word. It comes from the word neged, which the idea behind this is one that is similar to but different. One that is comparable to but not the same. I like the statement that was used. I, I don't remember who coined it first. But God did not make woman from a bone out of Adam's head so that she might be superior to him. Nor did he make her out of a bone from his foot so that he might step upon her. Rather, he made her from the bone from his side. Everybody touch your, touch your ribs. What happens whenever you touch your ribs? Your elbow goes up, right? So if a man puts his arm out like that straight from his elbow, he can wrap his arm around the lady that, uh, that is his wife. This idea becomes that he is her protector, provider, and caretaker. And so the point is, indeed, as man and woman, we do have roles. But just because we have roles does not mean that we are not equal. As I read this morning, in Christ, there is now neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Now, this doesn't mean, again, that we are not male and female anymore. We are. The point is, in, old, uh, in, in a lot of the eyes of the rabbis in the old days, there was this view that women were lesser than men. But before God, men and women are equals before him. So today, we should be grateful that God has made us as we are. There is much more to this story, and I'll continue it on next week. Because in the beginning, God did create them, male and female. Jesus actually makes this statement when talking about, uh, about marriage. In the book of Matthew, you find it. I want to continue on with this discussion about male and female. But it's going to take a turn next week, because we're going to start talking about the fall. Today, can you be grateful that you were made as a male or as a female, rejoicing that God has made you as you are? Can you rejoice saying, God, I recognize that I am not perfect, but that in Christ I am seen as, as righteous only because of Christ's action, but I'm covered by Him, and I'm seen by you in, in the light of who He is. This morning, can you rejoice in that? If you need a time of prayer to say, God, I want to ask, ask of your forgiveness because I've not been appreciative of being the male or female that you have made me to be. If, if you'd like a time of uh, asking or spending time in prayer, I'll be here to pray with you for any reason. 
And if you need a church home and you'd like Beach to be that church home, I'll be here to talk with you as we stand and sing our closing hymn.